Hey everybody, Darren Voros here. Today I'm here with Mark Ramsey and we're going to be talking about developing a luxury condo complex in Costa Rica. Mark's going to share his knowledge with us and his experience in building a project in Costa Rica. Before we get into it with Mark, if you haven't done so already, you can subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, and please feel free to leave comments and questions below for me. And without further ado, Let's get into it. Mark, thanks so much for taking some time out of your day to join us. Before we jump into it with you, why don't you give us a little bit of a background on who you are and what you do as a real estate investor? Hey, buenos dias, Darren. Uh, my name is Mark Ramsey, as he said. I'm from Vancouver, BC. I've uh, been an IT professional for 30 years, been doing real estate investing for about eight, uh, probably nine now, actually. Um, been specializing in uh, apartment complexes and stuff in the U.S. up until about a year ago. Uh, now I'm starting to focus more on international investment, uh, pre-construction condos in Mexico, uh, building a house down here in Costa Rica, this development we're going to talk about today in Costa Rica as well, and also looking at uh, buying some condos in the Algarve region of Portugal as well. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. Yeah, you're a busy guy. You got a lot of projects on the go. Congratulations. That's amazing. Why? My first question would be why Costa Rica? Why did you choose uh, to develop there um, versus or, or, or maybe why are you choosing the locations that you're choosing? Um, Costa Rica, Mexico and potentially Portugal. Uh, well, let's start with Costa Rica. So the main uh, driver in Costa Rica was I'm already now living here and looking at building a house in the area that we're in now. And so doing a project down here is fairly easy for me to oversee and manage. Uh, so it just became down, came down to once we had made that decision to finding a suitable location, uh, the right type of project, and if all, if all that kind of stuff lined up, then we would go move forward with it. And that has happened. Um, Mexico was more, it was just a, a really good deal on a beachfront condo in Acamal, Mexico. Uh, it, was, it was a pre-construction, so there was really nothing for me to do on that. And it came with financing, so it was a bonus. Mm. Uh, and talking about Portugal, um, Portugal is a place where you, as a foreigner, can get financing. So we're looking at condos in the Algarve region, usually in the three to 350,000 euro or dollar uh, price range. Uh, but we can get 80% financing at under one and a half percent interest. Wow. So if you can rent the, pro the high season down there is about 10 weeks and the rental rates are high enough during the high season to more than pay all of your costs for the property for the year. And then anything you get on top of that is gravy. So that's the next, uh, the next step we're going to go into once we get the project here in play uh, in uh, play Flamingo underway. In, in Costa Rica specifically, how did you start to do your research? Because I'm guessing you were in Canada when you started to look at developing in Costa Rica. What was the first step that you took in order to uh, start to look at an opportunity there? Uh, we came down for a conference two and a half years ago on moving and living overseas. And while we, after the conference was over, we actually came down to the southern zone of Costa Rica, uh, where we are living now and where we're going to be building our house and did uh, some property tours and did some research, uh, boots on the ground research into the area. Uh, but we decided that that wasn't enough to make decisions on, on, on where we wanted to be for sure and so forth. So we spent a month here, uh, end of 2019, beginning of 2020, and spent a whole bunch of time up in the northwest corner of the country. Um, the Guanacaste region, uh, Playa Flamengo, Playa Potrero, down to Tamarindo, uh, Samra. And then we went inland to Monteverde, La Fortuna, Bihagua. There's a bunch of areas. We just did this big circle tour for about a month. And it gave us a better understanding of other, other good areas in the country where you can uh, invest or live. And with that, after that tour, I came back down to Costa Rica for a week, a couple of weeks later, and uh, did some, a lot of boots on the ground research and uh, looking for properties in the area we're in now. What the realization we came to is the place that we're doing our development in is called Playa Flamingo. And it's up on the Northwest coast in the Guanacaste area. It's, um, it's a lot drier area up there, and we really didn't have an interest in living there. It's hotter, it's drier, uh, but it's a huge tourist draw up there uh, because that's where all the big resorts are. That's where all the adventure activities are, the zip lining, the whitewater rafting, the volcano tours, um, horseback riding, ATV tours, uh, snorkeling, diving, windsurfing. Um, uh, deep sea fishing, it's huge here too. So all these, mm -hmm. a lot of them seem to be based out of that corner of the country. So if you're gonna do a tourist development here, um, that is where you wanna be doing it because that's where, and that's also with uh, the government opened a new airport there called Liberia, specifically so they could funnel most of their tourist traffic into that corner of the country. 
So it's basically a 45 minute drive from that airport to most of the major tourist zones along the coast up in that part of the country. So it's a huge mm. driver and it's, a, it's, it's where most people are going to come to vacation in Costa Rica. Yeah, I've spent some time there in that area. Uh, it's, it's great, Liberia, flying directly to Liberia. But uh, that area is, is you know, definitely the most touristy area, the most populated area. So I can see why as an investor, you want to invest there because you want to sell to those kinds of individuals that may not necessarily want to live in Costa Rica, but they want to own something and come down and spend some time there. And it was that kind of the thinking behind it, what you're developing? Yeah, so this, this is going to be 16 units and uh, of which we're going to be selling 10 of them. And we're going to be selling them not probably not to people who intend on living there all year. They're mostly going to be people who want to come down for a couple of months of the year and then rent it out for the rest of the year. But they also want to make sure they're owning a piece of property that's in the right market so that they can get those year round rentals. Um, mm -hmm. My architect down here classifies Playa Flamingo as kind of the Beverly Hills of Costa Rica. And if you look at some of the, the residences and things there, you, you understand why. Uh, also, the government of Costa Rica is putting most of their um, the money towards development of tourism into that corner of the country, and they're aiming everything at the mid to high level traveler. They're not interested in the in the backpacker crowd. They're interested mm. in that in that mid to high level traveler who's going to be doing the all inclusive, who's going to be renting out nice places, spending lots of money in the restaurants and that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and that's exactly what this area is. So that's who we're aiming at. So we're gonna we're building 16 luxury condos. Uh, I timed it. It was a six minute walk to the beach and we're right up in behind uh, a development called the Palms. And the Palms is one of the most famous beachfront developments in Costa Rica. And we're mm -hmm. literally six minutes behind it walking down the road. And you're on, nice. you're on this, you're on this gorgeous beach. And then right over beside us on the next bay over Playa Petrero, not as nice of a beach, but they're putting in one of the largest marinas in Costa Rica, which is also going to have a, there's not many marinas in this country and it's going to be a huge draw as well. So there's, there's a lot of different economic plays in this one little area that we're working on. Amazing. And I know you're sitting in your house that you're renting in mm -hmm. Costa Rica right now, yes. you're uh, building in that same development, but the picture that's in your background is actually from your new place that you're going to be developing is that right yeah so we were down there in december and i stood up where the pool is going to be on the property and just took this picture out towards yeah, so it's showing the beach of playa flamingo on my left uh here yeah. i'll move out of the way and you can yeah. see the uh wow. all the luxury high-rise condos and uh hotels and stuff off in the distance there that's at the other yeah. end of the beach um margaritaville is right down there as well a very mm -hmm. famous uh hotel yeah. and resort and then off to, uh, it'll be my right then, is because uh, the picture's backwards, is Playa mm. Petrero, which you can't see where the new marina is going in. The picture where you were standing when you took this is where the pool is going to be in your new resort. Yes, and, they, and they, uh, the units are going to be up behind the pool. Uh, so they, they'll even have a higher altitude and better views. And the property actually has, uh, the penthouse units will have 360 degree views of both harbors, all that development in front of them, plus all the mountains and lush tropical jungle behind it. Wow. So. Okay, so let's jump in. How did you find this property and, and how did you go about the process of acquiring it? This property was a bit of a fluke uh, and it was COVID. It was a COVID created opportunity. So um, I run a, a real estate investment group here in Vancouver, uh, along with a couple other guys called Synergy. And one of our members uh, was doing some research and he put this property popped up on one of his feeds. And it was actually a couple of real estate agents who owned the property and were trying to sell it. Uh, their deal, they had it sold, COVID hit, uh, the deal fell through, and now they were suddenly stuck with no sale on the property and they needed the money for other things. So they dropped the price on it and offered uh, vendor financing as well. Uh, so we have actually have a year to pay off the property. Uh, we looked at the cost per square foot. It's about two thirds of an acre up on the side of a hill and the cost per square foot was extremely good for the area. And considering where it was located and the views it had and so forth, we decided that uh, we needed to at least get an offer in on it so we could do our due diligence. Um, it's that due diligence period that really shows how good the property is, how, how good of an investment it is. So that was, that was kind of how it came about and then everything kind of flowed from there. What kind of interest were they Zero. offering you on that? Zero percent, yes. that's a pretty, Zero percent. Okay. <laughs> uh, I mean, it was really, it was, it was, it was it, I think we paid about a hundred thousand upfront in total between the deposit yeah. and the first payment when we closed. And then we paying the balance out over 12 months. Uh, so it's really quite reasonable. And, and 
Uh, because of the whole process down here, we can't actually do anything with the property for at least a year anyway. And they're happy with that because we can't incur any liens or anything against title during that, that financing period. And, and on our contract states, we can't anyway. Hey, we have to pay cash for everything. Mm. So it, it, all, it all actually worked out really well. And why is it that you can't do anything for a year, Mark? What, what happens during that year? Okay, so there's a, the development process, process in Costa Rica is a lot like it is in some other countries, but it, it's, it is very unique to here in some ways. There's a lot of things you have to do. For instance, we actually bought two parcels of land and we were merging them together into one. Um, now, whenever you have a parcel of land in Costa Rica, they have a couple of different things that are assigned to it. One of them is called an uso suelo, which basically means use of the land. It's a lot like zoning back home in Canada. So the yeah. property is basically zoned for a certain type of development. And in this case, the uso de suelo for this property was two lots and it was a one house on each lot. And so that was all that was permitted. So as part of our due diligence, we went, went and spoke to the municipality and said, can we get an uso de suelo for a 16 unit condo complex? Actually, we, we originally asked for a 10, but then our architect came back and said, no, you should do 16. I can put 16 units on the property. I went, okay. Uh, so we actually got the, as part of our due diligence, we got the Uso de Suelo for a 16 unit condo complex. So that was, that was the first check mark on our box. Okay, yeah, we, we can use the property for what we want to use it for. The next biggest thing in Costa Rica, and it, it's whether you're buying a lot, a house, um, especially lots, is called a water letter. Um, so the water department here is called AYA or AYA, and they, they're the governing body that covers, that covers all of the water supplies in the country. You have to get a letter from them stating that they have the capacity to supply you with enough water for the development that you're building. Uh, the problem with Guanacaste and the reason the government took over all of the water supplies in Costa Rica was because all the big uh, commercial resorts and hotels actually drained the aquifer in Guanacaste dry. And every, every year, the locals had no water. There, were, there, were, there was water shortages. There was issues everywhere. And the government finally stepped in and said, that's it. We're, we're taking over. We're going to make sure this doesn't happen. Uh, and they also put a pipeline in from Liberia, where the airport is, uh, to bring in major water supplies to that area because they want to develop there, but they can't do it without the water. So that, that was our next step, is we had to get the water letter. Um, unfortunately, as with anything in Costa Rica, departments either don't talk to each other or they have conflicts between each other. So the federal level of the water department has a conflict with the regional level of the water department. And the regional level will only give us five units per parcel. Uh, whereas the federal government saying, no, you can have 16, but we have to get through the local guys. So in order to get past this first phase of our development, we had to get, we got two water letters for five units each, one for each parcel. So there's, there, there's, that is one of the biggest hoops you'll run into down here is making sure you've got legal water for your premises. Um, and then the next thing you have to do is you have, before you sign off on the property, you, you want to also do a soil study. So you have a company come in, they drill holes around the property, they see what, what's under the ground. Uh, and that determines whether you can have septic fields or sewage treatment uh, that determines what you can build on the property, how big it can be, all that kind of stuff. So we, we, we did all of that before we even, before we closed on the property, before we would close on the property. Uh, so when we got everything back that we needed, everything looked good. The architect was happy with all the reports. Uh, we closed on the property. Um, once we closed on the property, because we're building more than 10,000 square feet, uh, you have to do what they call a D1 environmental study. So they take all of, they take your uso de suelo, your water letter, your soil studies, and then a whole bunch of uh, your sewage analysis, uh, property drainage, uh, uh, how the capacity of people on the property, they take all this stuff into account and, and they produce a report that goes to the government. And that takes anywhere from 12 months to two years to get your D1 environmental completed. Um, mm -hmm. We're hoping because of COVID, nobody was doing anything for quite a while and we've already submitted our D1 now. And now there's gonna be a large rush of things happening again that we've got ours in. And we're hoping to see, we're hoping to get sign off within 12 months so that we can start build. At that point we can start pulling permits and actually building at that point. What's your cost, Mark? Um, prior to even closing on the property, you mentioned all of those things that needed to be done. Um, mm -hmm. Can you give us an approximation on, on the cost of doing that before? Because you're basically conditional at that point, similar to a, yes. buying a property here. You know, you'd be doing a home inspection or whatever. If it's commercial, you'd be doing a phase one environmental. That's all out of pocket before you even yes. decide to sign off on it. So what, what, what would the cost be on something like that in Costa Rica? Well, you do it in stages. So for instance, the water letter costs 
next to nothing. It's just someone actually applying for it and, and getting it. Um, the soil study was under $1,000. Um, the the uh, Uso de Suelo was just a letter uh, requesting, we want to do this, can we, get a, can we get an Uso de Suelo? So there was just the cost of the architect's time to write up the letter and send it in and get, and, and get the letter back from the municipality. So it really didn't cost, I'd say our total costs were under $4,000 uh, before we decide to sign off on the property. Hmm. And then as soon as we took con uh, conditions off the property, between that time and closing, we actually spent another 20 some odd thousand dollars because at that point we were, we were committed to the project. Hmm. And uh, we paid the architect to get the D1 environmental study underway. So he, he was putting together uh, all the, a lot of the additional stuff that was required for the D1, uh, doing drawings, uh, property layouts, all that kind of stuff and getting it all done. And he had a lot of that done by the time we closed on the property. Nice. So, um, and, and then of course, then we paid for that. So I, I'd say we're, we're into it for uh, the down, the purchase price of the property plus about 30 grand at this point. But okay. we've got, yeah. we got a lot out of that, so. And, and, and who's on the team down there? Like is, is the architect really the quarterback uh, of the project? And is that, would you say the most vital element of after you found the property, uh, engaging a good architect was the next big piece? Um, down here, quite often the architect will take on the role of everything. So they do all the initial drawings and planning. They, get, they do all the estimates. Uh, they, pull, they, they help pull your permitting and stuff. And uh, if they don't have their own team, if he doesn't have his own team for building, uh, he will he will find an appropriate builder to work with that he's used in the past and trusts and that sort of thing. So yeah, the the architect is your quarterback down here, and that's who I'm working with primarily. But also really important down here is your lawyer, um, mm. because you need a good legal team down here because you're dealing with uh, a, a foreign country and di different legal structures and different property ownership structures, different corporate structures. So you, you want someone who understands all that, speaks English and can give you a translated copy of all documents. So you know what you're signing. So we do have a really, really good lawyer down here. And another thing we pick because we're doing a condo development, at some point we have to stratify the development, come up with condo bylaws and everything. Is this a 50 page document that they have to come up with mm -hmm. uh, and, and the whole stratification of the property as well. So you wanna make sure you're dealing with somebody who can deal with all that. So we did some research and we found a, a good lawyer who's done this stuff in the past and has a good reputation. Uh, the next thing is, is finding a good accountant because all the different levels of government here don't talk to each other, even on the tax and corporate side, there's all these different, they have six different, six different, uh, computer systems within the tax department and they don't talk to each other. Mm. So you need a, you need an accountant who understands all that and knows what needs to go where and when and how to file it and make sure that you're informed ahead of time of what needs to be done. In fact, I've got filings that have to be done by the end of this month that we have to deal with. Um, and, and it turns out that our architect, his accountant, um, is one of the accountants who uh, consults with the government on new tax laws. So this guy is actually the guy who writes tax laws in this country. So if you want somebody <laughs> on your side to figure out how to not pay taxes, get the accountant who actually writes the tax laws. Okay. Not and a bad so that's connection. We, yeah. <laughs> so that's what we did, right? So um, those those three are really architect, uh, lawyer, and accountant are all huge down here. The rest mm -hmm. of it you can work out yourself. I'm, I'm project manager for this. I'm going to be spending time up there every couple of weeks. That's when we finally get to the build process to make sure everything's going as I want it to be. And then once you got all that kind of done, then then you start to get into things like property management and stuff like that. But we have tons of time. Uh, but one thing we are working on right now is the actual marketing because uh, I actually wanna have the 10 units that we're selling, I wanna have them sold before uh, we even put a shovel in the ground. Yeah, so. for sure. Can I, can I go back to, because you mentioned the water letter, the yes. math didn't add up there. So you got 10 units approved basically, because yes. two parcels of land, letter five for each, units each, five units each. So what yes. are you gonna do with the other six units? They're not okay, gonna have so, water? <laughs> no. So what happens is, is uh, because we know we're not going to, this isn't going to happen for a year. We're not going to get the D1 done for a year. That that's more than enough time for us to work out issues between the, the water board and the federal side of it, uh, and get them to say yes, you can have 16 units on the property. So uh, the architect is confident we're not going to have an issue with the water. But we wanted our big thing is we wanted to get that D1 environmental submitted now, mm. uh, and so we just made a couple modifications, submitted it. Um, with the water letter for 10 units, knowing that we would be upgrading that to 16 at a later date. And our architect is actually a Canadian out of Alberta. 
who's been building down here for 15 years. So okay. the guy is fluent in English, obviously, because he was born and raised in Canada. He's fluent in Spanish. He's been down here for 15 years. He's got his own shop. They build their own cabinetry. They're actually a window manufacturer. Uh, because of our project and all the, all the stainless steel railings we're putting in, he's actually buying the equipment to build the railings so that he can mm. do that ongoing. He, he was quite defined. And no. he's, got, he's got a lot of connections that are going to help us out a lot and help us save money, but make the place look fantastic. How did you find him, Mark? Uh, I can't even remember how I found him directly. Uh, I found him a year ago when I was here looking at property for our house. And someone had referred me to him because he was a Canadian architect. Uh, we ended up using a different designer down where we're living because they actually it was actually the builder in the area. We decided to use their designer down here, but I wanted to use Michael for the project up there because I think he was more suited to that project than just doing mm. a little house for us. What's the timeline um, that you're expecting beginning to end of acquisition to, uh, to move in to possession? First saw the property listed back in, I think it was April and put the offer in back in April. Uh, we took uh, all our conditions off of that in July and we closed at the end of September. Okay. And then we submit, we just submitted the D one at the beginning of December, uh, sorry, of January. So the D with the D one environmental applications now in, we're expecting that it's going to be a minimum of 12 months for the, for the D one. And we're going to say up to say 18 months. Uh, once the D one environmental is done uh, at that point, we'll have all of our drawings and done and so forth. The D one environmental will come back as well. And they'll, they'll come back to us during the review and say, we like this change. We like that change. We like this clarified or that clarified, which may lead to some di design changes. But basically by the time we get that environmental uh, approval back, we expect to have the project completely uh, designed, costed out, builder sourced, materials sourced. So we expect after about, I'd say uh, 12 to 18 months from now, we'll uh, get, all, get our permits authorized. And uh, once the permits are authorized, we're there, we're, we're there building. We're expecting about a 12 month build on this. Uh, they actually are fairly efficient at the builds, especially on the larger projects. So as long as the money is there and the bills are getting paid, uh, we, yeah, we expect it to be not bad. So I'd say we should have our, our first off, uh, occupiable units in what's that, uh, yeah, two and a half years. And, and do you have an idea of, of price point? Do you have an idea of features of these units? Are they going to be a couple bedrooms, a couple bathrooms? What, what's the plan for the, for yeah. the overall project? Uh, like I said, there'll be 16 units and there'll be a range of one, two, and three bedroom, mostly two and three. Uh, everything with uh, large, large balconies, great views, uh, a lot of windows that open up. Uh, luxury fittings like, you know, stainless steel appliances, granite countertops, uh, high quality uh, bath faucets and fixtures and stuff like that. High quality, uh, both task lighting and area lighting and floor lighting. Uh, the property itself is going to have a lot of uh, pathways uh, with a lot of green space on it. We're having a cascading pool system where there's going to be up, a pool up by the clubhouse with a series of cascading pools down to a lower pool. So you can go, you can get in, you can get in the pools anywhere you want. Um, there's a, we're trying to negotiate with the neighbor right now to get a piece of his property so we can wrap around and put our clubhouse uh, and get even better views from the clubhouse area. Um, the penthouse units will be rooftop. Some of them will have their own small plunge pools. Uh, they'll have, like I said, 300, probably 270 to 300 degree views up in the penthouse units. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, On-site parking, of course, gated on-site caretakers. Uh, and like I said, a six minute walk to the beach. What's the price point? Uh, I think our one bedrooms are going to start around the 300,000 US and mm -hmm. uh, three bedrooms uh, and penthouses might hit upwards of seven to $800,000. So it's pretty uh, reasonable gonna, when you think be, about yeah, it. Th anywhere between 300,000, 800,000, what we're looking at right now, we were just waiting to get, we need, we need a final budget number to come up with the final numbers. But for marketing purposes, we are going to come up with some numbers because we do, like I said, we do want to start marketing it soon. So. You mentioned earlier on um, a couple of things. You mentioned one that a lot of people will probably buy these, use them a little bit, and then also when they're not there, rent them out. What is the weekly rental rate or maybe daily rental rate that somebody might be able to fetch on one of these units? Uh, if you look at what Airbnb is going to right now around the area, uh, depending right now, it's hard to tell because COVID's really killed things and prices are down because people want to get occupancy. Yeah. Uh, before COVID though, we were seeing prices for a lot of these units, uh, like a one bedroom would be around 150 a night, uh, a two bedroom upwards of 200, uh, three bedrooms and penthouses, you know, it could be anywhere three or 400 a night, depending on, uh, 
on, on the on the luxury level of the unit. Now, I, you said you're going to sell 10. Yes. Uh, what are you going to do with the other six? Uh, so there's three partners on the deal, and each of us is going to retain two uh, units each, uh, which will uh, personal use and rental as a rental pool as well. What is your best piece of advice for anyone wanting to develop uh, in Costa Rica? Uh, I know you've given us so much insight as to the process, but is there something that you've missed that you'd like people to know that if they want to do this, this is what they should be aware of? Uh, well, the first thing down here is don't shop online. Uh, there's, there's a lot of stuff online, a lot of properties for sale online. Uh, but as we will talk about with the other interview we're doing, it, it, you have to be boots on the ground. You have to talk to people. You have to go around, find all the different eight real estate agents around, talk to them, see what they have. There's no MLS down here. Everybody's got their own listings. Uh, you have to go talk to the property managers. They're not interested in selling you a piece of property. They just want to manage your property. So if they know of a piece of property that they can get you a deal on, that you could eventually use them as a property manager on, they'll give it to you. Mm. So it really, you really have to come, start talking to people, start driving around. There's a lot of properties here that have just a little for sale sign up with a phone with a WhatsApp number on them. And uh, when you down here, when you WhatsApp, when you send a WhatsApp message, you send them English and Spanish messages because you have no idea if it's a Tico selling the property and only speaks mm. Spanish or if it's. Uh, an expat or somebody who speaks English who's trying to sell it. So um, boots on the ground is super. If you if you want to find the deals, if you want to if you want to get the best deal in the best location, you've got to come here and you've got to look. Thanks so much for taking some time out of your day to walk us through this. Uh, I'm fascinated by investing in a foreign country. I'm looking at development in Costa Rica as well. Uh, you're a huge resource for me. I really appreciate <laughs> all the information that you've shared so far. Uh, hugely valuable. So thanks for taking some time out of your day to walk us through this. If you guys enjoyed the session and like the idea of investing in the Costa Rican market, hit the like button below. You can also subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, and feel free to leave comments and questions below for both Mark and myself. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, or check out my website at darrenboros.com. With that, I'll say, Mark, thanks so much again for your time this, uh, today, this morning. I really appreciate the insights that you've given us on the Costa Rican market. Um, and please enjoy your time in Costa Rica. I know you're living there full time now. I'm so jealous of being away from Canada in the winter uh, and being able to move your family down there. I'm really excited to see the progress on this project as it, uh, as it moves through. Uh, I wish you the best of success on this real estate investing journey and hopefully we'll be able to touch base very soon and, and keep uh, connected throughout the, uh, throughout the build. Yeah, muchas gracias, Darren, and uh, hasta luego. Awesome, thanks, Mark. Talk to you soon. Thank you.